Today is June 19th, 2020, or Juneteenth, a day of emotion which aims to celebrate the ending of slavery in the United States. More specifically, June 19th, 1865, was the day that Major General Gordon Granger landed at Galveston, Texas, with the news that the war had ended and that the enslaved people of Texas were free. With the inaction of General Orders No. 3, which stated, the people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. This was two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which ended slavery only in the rebellious Confederacy, but had few mechanisms of enforcement behind it. The full and legal emancipation of African Americans wouldn't come until later that year in December, when the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution would be ratified. However, despite the expansion of citizenship and the abolition of slavery during the Reconstruction period, generations and generations of African Americans were subjected to de facto and de jure forms of enslavement through white supremacy, segregation, economic barriers, acts of violence, and more. In the early years of celebration, Juneteenth was known as Jubilee Day and was mostly observed by the African American population of Texas. Starting as a small celebration by the Freedmen's Bureau in Austin, Texas, Jubilee Day attendance continued to grow, and by the 1890s, Jubilee Day was known as Juneteenth. If you're interested in learning more about Juneteenth, make sure to check out living historian Cheney McKnight's social media channels called Not Your Mama's History. She offers many great videos and events on Juneteenth, as well as many other historic topics. Although in its early development, Juneteenth was mainly a Southern holiday, there were many abolitionists and civil rights activists in the North that worked tirelessly to see their hopes and dreams of racial equality come to fruition. One such family of abolitionists and civil rights activists is the Ruffin family, buried here on Indian Ridge Path. Originally from Virginia, George Ruffin was the eldest son of black parents with free status. His family moved to Boston in response to a law that prohibited free blacks in Virginia from learning to read or write. Ruffin attended Boston Public School and found work in a barber shop, often the site of lively political discussions. In 1858, Ruffin wed Josephine St. Pierre. Throughout their marriage, the two of them would work to support many social causes. George and Josephine helped recruit blacks to the military and even served on Boston's Sanitary Commission. In Boston, they lived on Beacon Hill with many neighbors, both white and black, who shared their abolitionist ideals. After training as an apprentice in a law office, George was accepted to Harvard Law School in 1868 and became the first African American to graduate, completing the two-year program in only one year. In 1871, Ruffin was elected to the Massachusetts legislature, and he served on the Boston City Council from 1876 to 1877. He worked for the law firm of Harvey Jewell, focused on criminal law and represented black and white clients. Ruffin wrote an eloquent preface to the autobiography of his friend Frederick Douglass. While Ruffin had the benefit of attending Harvard, he admired Douglass for achieving an education through other means. Quote, Douglas has surmounted the disadvantage of not having a university education by application and well-directed effort. He seems to have realized the fact that it is not positively necessary to go to college and that information may be had outside of college walks. Books may be obtained and read elsewhere, Ruffin wrote. In 1883, Ruffin reached another milestone by becoming a judge in the District Court of Charlestown, the first African American to be appointed to the bench in a northern state. He presided over the court until his death. Three quarters of a century would pass before another African American would hold a full-time judicial position in Massachusetts. Ruffin died from kidney disease at age 52 in 1886. His legacy, however, continues on. 
In 1984, the George Lewis Ruffin Society was established to help support minority professionals in the Massachusetts criminal justice system. It also aided in promoting understanding between minority communities and the criminal justice system. The inscription on George Ruffin's grave beneath the graceful Japanese maple tree on Indian Ridge Path affirms that he was, quote, the first colored judge appointed in the North. On the opposite side, his epitaph reads, He did his duty bravely, and no one trust betrayed. Josephine St. Pierre was born in Boston to Eliza and John St. Pierre. Her father was a successful clothing importer and exporter. She served on the boards of the Massachusetts Moral Education Society and the Massachusetts School Suffrage Association, where she became acquainted with Julia Ward Howe and Lucy Stone. Howe and Stone eventually convinced Josephine to join the New England Women's Club, where she became the first African-American member. After the death of her husband, Josephine Ruffin lived another 38 years, devoting herself to the causes of civil rights, women's suffrage, and children's education. She was one of the founders of the Women's Era Club, whose membership included middle-class educated black women who focused on the rights of African-American women. With the money left to her by George, she was able to finance and, with her daughter Florida, serve as editor of the organization's monthly publication, Women's Era. Ruffin was the first African-American woman to own, edit, and publish a newspaper for black women. She also became a member of the New England Women's Press Association at the time she wrote for the Boston Courant, another African-American weekly newspaper. Ruffin believed that organizations established across the country by black women should come together, and she organized the first black women's club conference. The National Federation of Afro-American Women was subsequently formed and eventually merged with the Colored Women's League to become the National Association of Colored Women, NACW. Our women's movement, Ruffin said, is led and directed by women for the good of women and men for the benefit of all humanity. Today, Ruffin is honored at the Massachusetts State House as one of five women to represent the story of women from the state. Josephine Ruffin became a link between white reformers, many of them women, and African Americans. Quote, For the sake of our children, it is our duty to stand forth and declare ourselves and principles, to teach an ignorant and suspicious world our aims and interests are identical with those of all good aspiring women. Josephine Ruffin died in 1924 at the age of 81. She was buried here at Mount Auburn next to George Ruffin and not too far away from Julia Ward Howe and other friends and associates that she had in life. The Ruffin's daughter, Florida Ruffin Ridley, continued working as an essayist and a journalist, focusing on the many questions of race relations, and she maintained an abiding interest in black history. In 1943, Florida Ruffin Ridley was also interred here at Mount Auburn beside her parents. In 2019, the Coolidge Corner School in Brookline was named after her and will officially be recognized as the Ridley School in September of 2020. Hi, I'm Corinne Elliconi from Mount Auburn Cemetery. Thanks for watching our video. We're looking to put out more virtual content in the time of COVID-19 so that you can continue to learn about the cemetery along with us from the safety of your home. Thanks for watching and be well.